I'm a feminist, but recently when someone said to me that my brand was vain and shallow, I was so pleased. <laughs> Who said that to you? Who said your brand is vain and shallow? Did they mean you're like your comedy stylings? No, like me. Your bra- wow, I don't think you're vain and shallow. I think of you as a woman of great depth and a lot of self-awareness. I mean, I know, that's great. But the other one just sounds so much more sexy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds fun. Yeah. No, I see that. I do yeah. see that. No. I'm a feminist, but I love that people call a vodka soda with a dash of cranberry the guilty feminist cocktail, even though it used to be called a Rose Kennedy. I have taken another woman's drink, but she was super rich, and I'm not sure she was very nice, so I'm good with it. <laughs> it was JFK's mum. Yeah. Uh, she had many children, but most of them seemed to be men who cheated on their wives, so I'm fine with it. I think all of the men that she had, she just she sired. She don't no, you don't yeah. sire. That's father. You she yeah. met, and uh, she had a daughter that then had a lobotomy. Oh my god! Yeah, it's a dark. Family. That's a sad story. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm a feminist, but I've been very anxious about my teenage daughter's social life since seeing her birthday wish list was only books. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I was like, who is this child? What's happened to her? And then I was like, is she on drugs, do you think? My husband was like, why would you think that? I'm like, she doesn't want makeup, she doesn't want clothes, what's wrong with her? But I worry. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're a teenager, like, but anyway, she's a good kid, but still. <clears throat> I'm a feminist, but I love wearing all black and pearls because it makes me feel like Chanel, like Coco Chanel. Mm. But then I have to remind myself she was a Nazi sympathizer. And not want to look like her, but then I have to push that out of my mind so I can enjoy the black dress and the pearls. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to be able to carry off like a big flower, like a chest flower. You know, when she used to wear like a black yeah. fabric gardenia. I'd like to be able to pull off an oversized one. I don't think I can. Um, I'm a feminist, but when people find out I've been married 22 years and then they try and do the math to figure out how old I am, I always say, don't bother, (laughs) child bride. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, it happens a lot where I'm from, so they're like, okay. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but... (laughs) But... If, if Pretty Patel lost her job and her cat ran away and she went to Boots to spend her Boots points and they said, oh, sorry, these have expired. And she went to Pilates to use her sixth session and they said, oh, sorry, you had to use that by Friday and it's Saturday morning. And then she went to McDonald's after a night out and they said, oh, sorry, we're not serving chips anymore. The chips have run out. We're not going to put on anymore because we're just about to close the door. And then she went home and she'd lost her, the key to her house. And the people inside were asleep and she did just like, oh, they couldn't hear her. Or they probably pretended they couldn't hear her. So they don't really like living with her that much. And then she had to go and sleep on a bench. And then in the morning she woke up and she remembered that she didn't have a job. And she felt super, super bummed out. And then she went back to Boots with the cart and said, look, please, I've got all these reward points. They were like, sorry, they've expired. You should have used them before, Pretty Patel. And everyone in her world was just like, letter of the law, letter of the law, letter of the law, letter of the law. I would be fine with it. Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Cindy B, and our very special guests, Poppy Chapman and Amrit Paula here, talking about The Voice. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Cindy V, and we are talking about having a voice. So, do you think you found your voice, Cindy V? Do I think I found my voice? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, comedy is me finding my voice. You know, when I was very young, I would always be telling jokes. But it was a bit of a pain in everyone's ass, because I had this terrible stammer. And the jokes weren't very good, so it was just double whammy 
horrible for most people. And my mother would refuse to let me talk on the dining table because it would take so long. She would say, shut up, we have no time, write it down. <laughs> and she would give me a paper and a pencil and I would wow. sit and write down what had happened in my day because she was like, no one has the time for this. Um, <laughs> Well, which, you know, I sympathize with that now, now that I have kids. But anyway, um, so, and then for many years, I didn't do anything that involved, explicitly involved speaking. I mean, I did things, you know, I studied and this and that. But when I found comedy, it was really my voice, as in literally my voice, uh, but also my voice in that making people laugh has always been something that has been very meaningful to me. So in that sense, I found my voice. Have I found my comedy voice? No. You feel you're still developing a comedy voice, yes. but comedy is the conduit to your voice. Yes. It's such a wonderful thing, comedy. It's such a sort of valve release for everybody. It's like a whistling kettle. It's just like lets out so much steam. And I feel like we are going to need it in the coming years with whatever comes. <laughs> There's a lot of bad things happening in the world right now, and I think we're just going to desperately need comedy. And I think the more women and people of minority genders that can get into comedy and it could be writing comedy, it could be doing YouTube, it could be doing stand-up, it could be having a podcast. If you can find ways of being funny and talking about things in funny and entertaining ways, I think it really is. Well, but it's the only thing that gets you through something dark is to be funny because when terrible things happen, they're terrible. Mm -hmm. And the only sort of chink of light often is the ability to laugh in it. I was so surprised when my father died how much we laughed. We laughed as much as we cried. And that was, no, it, genuinely, it was a terrible, terrible shock. And he was too young. And we were just, I came out of nowhere. And I just found myself on a plane going back to Australia. I didn't know if I was going to make it. Because the nurse who spoke to me, he was a male nurse, he went, oh, you can try, but I don't think you're going to make it. No, he's not going to last. And I was like, sorry and he was like well it's gonna take you 24 hours he's not gonna last and I was like dude like you don't know that and don't tell me that and don't say it like that no well just gotta be realistic no you don't you've got to be comforting you're a nurse say you know you can prepare someone for the worst and say look I cannot guarantee you he'll be here but please get on that plane and try and you'll be with your family and we'll tell him you're coming that's what you should say Oh, I don't really need someone telling me my job. Um, okay. I feel like you do. And I sort of wanted to go into that sort of training mode, but there was no time because I needed to get to the airport. Um, but when we got there, my journey was fraught with comedy. And when I got there, I walked in and I was just in such a mess, such a state. I hadn't slept. It's just a time when you just haven't washed your hair. And I came in and my mother looked at me and went, you've changed your hair, which is a line in Out of Africa when Karen Blixen gets to Robert Redford through all of this. Actually, I think it's to her husband. Um, through, through the worst, you know, she's gone through this African desert and everything that could have happened has happened. And she just looks wild. And he goes, you've changed your hair. And she laughs. And so my mother said that to me when she saw me at the hospital. And we laughed so much. And it was like talking memories about him. We laughed and we laughed and we laughed as much as we cried and we were in shock. I think laughter and tears are so closely linked in the nervous system and in the brain. And it Because they're both drew openings us to the heart. Oh. They are. Laughter and tears are both openings to the heart. Well, in that case, please welcome to the stage the incredible Cindy B. <laughs> So I think we should all address the issue of my hair um, because I have historically always had very long hair. And now here we are uh, talking about people having yeah. hair that looks nuts. Um, basically, what has happened is recently I was having an argument with my therapist um, because, <laughs> because he would not repeat after me, Sindhu's sister is an asshole. Um, I had given him all the facts, so it's not like there was any dispute. But uh, he just wouldn't. And he kept saying, well, this is really not how this works. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure this is how it works. I come here, I give you money to be heard. <laughs> and for my feelings to be acknowledged. And my central feeling right now is that my sister is a major league asshole. So if you could just, and he was like, no. And he kept taking the conversation all these other directions. He was like, oh, you know, acceptance. You have to think about acceptance. I have a Totally, I said to him, what? I have completely accepted that she's an asshole. It's you who is not getting on board and making this really difficult. 
And then just when I was really, what do they call it in therapy? Starting to feel my feelings around the fact that I was being hoodwinked out of my money. Um, he did that thing that therapists do where they go, oh, well, that's it for this week. <laughs> we'll pick this up on Thursday. You know, the for those of you who've been to therapy, and for those of you who haven't, I highly recommend it. But anyway, uh, while you, when the, se the entire session is about talk about your feelings, no, no, reach into, no, let me hear. And then suddenly, ding, and he's like, no, shut, now please fuck off till next week. And you're like, what? <laughs> and at that point, when you're not done, but the session is done and the therapist is so chirpy about it, you know what you want to do, right? You want to get up and spit on your therapist. <laughs> you do. That's the feeling you have. Just a tiny spit, just, you know, just a little spit. And you want to say, let's pick this up next Thursday, bastard. <laughs> but, um... I didn't do that. I got up, I was getting my stuff. And then he did that thing that he had that like whole thing about change. You know, something you have to know about change. Other people don't change. Only you can change. And then maybe this week you can think about one of the ways that you can change. I'm like, you know what, Simon? Don't, I know how change works, all right? I got it. And I left his office and directly went to my hairdresser. And I said to her, Phyllis, uh, we need to cut my hair very short. And Phil, by the way, I just want to point out I mean, I call her Phyllis. I don't think it's her name. <laughs> but uh, we've got into this situation, which is, here we are. Because basically, when I first went there, it's a little hairdressing salon near my house. I walked in there the first time because I wanted to blow dry it, long hair. And immediately I understood that this is a very English is not our first language kind of place, right? Uh, which I know because English is my first language because colonialism. But anyway, so <laughs> I got it. Not only was English not their first language, these people were from some place that had never been colonized by, the, by you guys, basically. So I thought, okay, fine. And I don't really care because usually I can pick up where the accent is from or if I know where they're from, I can kind of get what they're saying. But I couldn't figure out where they were from. Anyway, I asked for the blow dry and this guy said, yes, I'll get my colleague to do it. And he called over and he said something, something, Philere. And I thought, wait, was that her name? I, I didn't know if that was her name, but I just left it alone. And then another guy walked by, the guy who'd washed my hair, and he said something, something, and I thought, oh God, is that her? But then I thought, I don't have to know her name. She's here. She blow dried my hair. It was great. And the second time I went, she was there, and I was like, oh, hi, <laughs> could you do my hair? Great. Third time, I phoned, because she'd done such a great job that it was the first time I was going to be on TV. And <laughs> yeah, I've been on TV. Anyway, um, and I thought, she has to do my hair. So I called, and the woman on the phone said, who should we get to blow dry your hair? And I was like, I really want her, but what am I going to say her name is? So I thought, okay, I'm going to make that sound that I think is her name. <laughs> and then the woman on the phone is going to be like, I'm sorry, we don't have such a person. And then I'll describe her, and then she'll tell me the right name. So I said, yeah, could I please have... Um, and she said, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is this woman's name? And then I show up, and it's this woman. I'm like, God damn, I don't know her name. I'll tell you one thing, though, folks. It is very different to call someone Philala on the phone, <laughs> but you cannot walk up to them and be like, yo, Philala, it does not work. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna walk up to her and I'm going to say a name that sounds like that sound. And she's gonna be like, that's not my name and we'll start again. So I went up to her and I said, hey Phyllis. And she said, hello darling. And I was like, fuck. And she always calls me Dharling, which, by the way, if you recognize the accent, please tell me where she's from, because I literally have no idea at this point. So anyway, I call her Phyllis, and that was four years ago. <laughs> so I said to her, I said, Phyllis, oh, and the other reason I've never tried to figure out where they're all from is because I know, I get a sense that they're from like some place, that they're war-torn place, and they fled. But I think the three guys who wash hair are from the place that did the war. There's some weird thing going on, and I don't kind of want to know. Because I'm just there for a blow dry. You know, so I have never really inquired. Um, but anyway, so I said to her, I said, Phyllis, you've got to cut my hair very short. Phyllis didn't want to do it. She's an older lady from wherever she's from, and she just likes long hair. And I was like, no. So we got from here to here to here to here. And then I was like, no, Phyllis, I want it shorter. So we got to sort of here, and then she wouldn't do it. And I said, Phyllis, I want it very short. And she said, No. And I said, but why? And she said, darling, because you have a very large face. <laughs> I was like, what? And I said, Phyllis, but what does that mean? She said, I don't want to say, but your face is too large. <laughs> now, when you are at very, you still have hope. 
But when you're too large, there's nowhere to fucking go. That's it. I'm here. So I was like, fine. I mean, you know, Phyllis is an expert. She's cut a lot of hair, seen a lot of faces. So I was like, fine. So here we are. Uh, I did go home, though, and, uh, after that, and uh, my two teenagers were at home, and I was like, you guys, what do you think about my hair? And my daughter was like, oh, my God, you look like a Karen. And I'm like, a Karen? Who's that? Yeah. Yeah. And my son looked at me, and then he looked at his phone, and he didn't even look up. He said, you know, the kind of Karen that complains about the salad at ZZ's. And I'm like, that is a very specific reference. Who is this bitch? Have we met her? How do you know this woman? Anyway, they left. And then, uh, and then, and then I checked in with my husband. Now, I'm at that stage in my marriage where when one of us asks the other one a question and you immediately recognize that there is a potential in the following conversation to combust into something bigger for which you have no appetite because you don't really give a shit, right? So you think, right, I got to deal with this in a way that shows that, that I expend the least amount of energy to seem moderately interested And when, when I walked in and said to my husband, so what do you think about my hair? You could see the little cogs in his head going. And he looked at me and he said, mm, yes. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you're not getting away with that. Nope, nope, nope. So I said to him, yes. And he said, very much. <laughs> so, yes, very much, Karen. Anyway, that's me. Thank you so much. Sit down, everybody. Yes, very much. I think it looks fantastic. Thank you. And yes, very much to that. Thank really you. Really good. Just a quick break in the podcast to say that we have Patreon now. Because we used to be able to sell tickets to live events, we never asked the audience for help before. But now in order to keep making the podcast, we need your help. If you join our Patreon from as little as £2.50 a month, you'll get some extra content and goodies and our everlasting appreciation. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash guilty feminist. I'm also making cameo videos and all the cash from that goes directly to Choose Love Help Refugees. If you go to the Cameo app or website, you'll see lots of comedians and actors there making birthday videos, congratulations, thank you videos, pep talk videos, anything like that. If you want to reach out to a feminist in lockdown who needs some encouragement or a nice present and you can't reach them because of social distancing, a Cameo video can make all the difference. So let me know the details of the friend that you'd like me to say, I'm a feminist part too, and I'll make a very special message for them. And that means you'll be choosing love for your friend and also for help refugees. And finally, if you're looking for things to read while in lockdown, uh, The Guilty Feminist book is available as an ebook, it's available as an audiobook, and it's available as a real live book. So buy it from someone who pays their tax. And now, back to the podcast. Our guests today, we have two. The first is an internationally respected mental health advocate, national policy advisor, and social entrepreneur who has worked all around the globe. Our second is a singer-songwriter, sarangi player, and vocalist in the genres of Punjabi folk, R&B, and soul. Please welcome to the stage Poppy Jamman and Amrit Kaur Lahir. <laughs> Poppy. Amrit. So could you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Hello. I'm Amrit, and as you said, I'm a singer-songwriter and Punjabi folk singer. Um, I do a bunch of stuff. I've done youth work. I studied history at SOAS, so I'm deeply, deeply passionate about um, colonial history and South Asia's, uh, South Asia in relation to that. And um, yeah, just loads of stuff. <laughs> and if you're listening at home and you can hear the jangling of bells... Yeah. Could you please describe your, the jewellery that you're wearing? So speaking of hair, um, I've got really long hair and I'm wearing something called a baranda. So it's a Punjabi, um, you see a lot of Punjabi women wear this, but across South Asia a lot of women wear this and it's kind of just a, um, an accessory to your hair. But um, I guess it has deeper roots for women's culture. And I guess everything that you see is 
decorative and and an accessory but I think in any culture they're symbols of something much deeper and they represent a silent history of sorts so Mm. if you want to see Amrit's jewellery please look at the show notes (laughs) and you will be able to see she has a magnificent headpiece on as well as bells on her hair yeah and you know when I so I grew up in India and when I went to school I went to school in Uttar Pradesh which is in the north and sort of east of Punjab and I had to wear this, but not with all the bells, just a plain black one. And it was called chutila. And chutia means braid. And we were always told that we never wanted to wear them. All the cool girls got to wear ribbons. But my mother was so anti-cool, it's not even funny. Anyway, and so she would make me wear this traditional chutila. And I used to say, why? And she used to say, because then you don't get split ends. Because your hair is braided into it. Turns out she was right. Because when I came here in my early 20s and I had long hair, I didn't have a single split end but I like wanted them because all the cool girls had them. So I was like, ah, I want some split ends, but it's actually also very good for your hair. Mm -hmm. And these decorative ones we wear at weddings, uh, which you all know in India last about 11 days. Um, So (laughs) it's 11 days of dressing up. It's amazing because when I go to foreign countries and perform, I performed at the Polish Jazz Festival and I was wearing something similar to this. And um, everyone came up to me after. They're like, so what was that ethereal sound when you, every time you walked? And <laughs> I was like, it was this. And they're like, oh, my gosh. We were like, where is it coming from? <laughs> <laughs> and Poppy. Poppy, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi. Yes. So I'm Poppy, Poppy Germain. Um, I am a social entrepreneur. So some of you may have heard of Mental Health First Aid. That's a few nods around that. So Mental Health First Aid was a social enterprise that I started. It's England's leading mental health training organization. Um, and I'm now the chief exec of an organization called the City Mental Health Alliance. And our vision is to create mentally healthy workplaces around the world. Wonderful. I also have a hair story, though. Can oh, I just please. Share that? So when I got my hair cut this short, my mum decided to tell everybody that I was ill. <laughs> wow. And I didn't correct her because it was easier not to. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Shame. So it's a bit of Cindy knows boycott. Well, yeah, it's called a boycott in India. Um, also, in India, in on the subcontinent, I should say, feminine beauty and long hair mm. go together. And in some religions, it's even in the religion for men and women. And Amrit knows about that. But it's not a religious thing. It's a cultural thing where one of the ways in which women show their beauty is with their long hair. So it's a huge thing. We were not allowed to cut our hair. You know, when I trimmed my hair, I was in a boarding school that I really liked because it was not near my parents. Um, and I trimmed my hair. I trimmed my hair and got an A minus. My mother took me out of school. And she didn't lead with the A minus. She said, you cut your hair. And I'm like, I didn't cut it. It was half an inch. She said, ha, you did do it because I'd been lying up until then. Um, and she took me out of school because she said, today you're cutting your hair. Tomorrow you'll have the drugs. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Exactly. So, so I, I deeply understand what your mother, uh, you know, she was like my daughter's unwell, like mentally, physically, everything that she's made her hair like that, right? That's, that's easier for them than that you would do it for a statement yeah. or just an identity. Yeah. or no, a, that makes yeah. them crazy. But yeah. you wanted short hair. You felt a connection to short Cut hair. my hair short because it's a choice, it's just what you wanted to do, have mm. a new look. But yeah, it's yeah. quite interesting. I guess when you've got all your, I mean, I remember last, a couple of summers ago, we had um, a family wedding, and you know, there was more than a thousand people there, like just like big, proper wedding. I walked in, and I was literally the only woman with this haircut, bearing in mind there was, and everybody just sort of did the look of, oh my God, like, do we talk to her? Do we not talk to her? How does this work? Because, you know, what is this person? Do we allow her to influence our kids? You know, so it's quite interesting being a professional South Asian British woman. And I think that identity just, you know, of being a British Asian woman and what that means in whichever culture you're in. And that sense of belonging is sometimes there, but most of the time you don't actually belong to any one environment. Mm. It's so interesting because when I was touring India, they, at any car I'd get in there and I'd say, or I'd pronounce Dili as Dili and not Delhi. Or they'll see my picture and I'd, I'd have long hair and they'll be like, the journalist would say, 
so like why are you so interested in Indian culture <laughs> like what is it that interests us like because I am Indian but when I went to India for the first time after my degree in history and just realized all these little things that oh actually I don't really belong here mm. but then when I go back to the UK do I really belong mm. there as well because I'm seen differently and my music's described differently and it'll be categorized as world music you know mm. so so do you find it difficult to find an authentic voice or do you think there is a new authentic voice that springs up precisely because of this duality I think authenticity to me means that you do what you do and that do what makes you feel good without having to justify yourself um, I'm so sorry I've just asked you to justify yourself there <laughs> awkward yeah. <laughs> but um yeah just just being who you are and I think finding your voice for me has been accepting that authenticity and accepting that actually I'm, I'm fine as I am and slowly I've been getting stages like Glastonbury and and the UN stage and all of these stages that I've realized that I can just continue on my path and evolve as an artist and and even in music you have this thing where you're like you're supposed to find your sound like how do you describe your music but if you look at artists that we really respect like Picasso and all of them people they um they, they were constantly finding their their medium and the context that they wanted to display their art in and they were constantly responding to the context that they were making art in so for me why am I separating myself from those kinds of artists when making music when I can constantly be evolving and I don't really have to find my sound as mm. it be and it's something that will evolve and how do you write lyrics how do you do they just come to you in the night is it a combination do you have to sit down and work hard on them where does it come from? I think it's like any writer. I think you'd find it when you're writing comedy or anything. Like... We write on stage a lot. We go up with an idea, <laughs> then we riff until the audience laugh. And then we say, what did I say? And yeah. then we say that bit again. And then we start with that bit. And then we riff again until the audience laugh. Then eventually <laughs> you're only saying the bits the audience laughed at. Is that how you write? Yeah, I mean, I think what happens is you have an intuition. Mm -hmm. And then you try that out on some unsuspecting people. And they laugh, and then you think, okay, the intuition has legs, and then you go back and you write jokes around it, or you, you work with it. I mean, I have very rarely woken up in the middle of the night and thought, there's a fully formed joke, let me immediately, although Seinfeld says he does stuff like that, but, you know, who knows. Um, so I don't have that. I just, there are times I have to sit in front of my screen and write something funny, like there's something specific coming up. It's almost impossible for me. But I guess with music, it's different, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, my, everyone's process is different. My process is learning to surrender to the process. And I think when we're forcing mm. writing, you'd get stuff, but it's not... You kind of just have to let it develop. And I think, for me, writing music is a very spiritual process. And I believe that sometimes, it, like the songs sometimes I sing, I don't know how I wrote them or how a melody came about. And you just respond to your surroundings or some, something. A conversation you had a year ago all of a sudden finds itself... Um, speaking to a rhythm somehow I'm very much inspired by poetry from South Asia from the Sufi poets like Bulesha and Rumi and all those people and my belief is actually instead of looking into kind of the Eurocentric references that we all have and popular culture references that actually there's so much more that exists on the other side of the world so when I studied at SOAS it was my first revelation that oh my gosh like there's like China in the 14th century, like did we know what happened there? Or, um, you know, the cultures that existed in Japan in the 19th century, and it was just a whole, literally a whole new world. Um, and for me, it's about, there are so many other sounds out there and so many instruments out there that need to be saved. And the instruments that, you know, um, I've played and grown up promoting have been lost to things like colonialism and um, the piano and guitar and violin are the first things that people pick up when there are so many things out there you know, to discover and play around with. And I think the same goes for literature as well, the literature that we're reading. There's so much deep poetry out there, and Cindy's a huge fan of, you know, Bolishar and all the, you know, all the greats from South Asia. So I just don't think we should limit ourselves when we're writing to the world that we know and the world that we can process, and we should definitely look beyond and educate ourselves. Yeah, that, sorry, that's what I meant to say. That's how I write comedy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I have a conversation a year ago, and then I just find a rhythm to it. And then so I look at the Sulfi poets and I, so similar, so, so, what we do is unsophisticated Sindhu, we should be ashamed. 
Uh, well, I mean, but there's a place for everything. There's a place for everything. There's a place for everything. But you know? that's a better thing than what we're doing. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> Just I mean, I do think it's more complex, and I think it's, you know, Yes, I think, I think that's, that's art mm. in a lot of ways. And I'm just, I'm just fucking talking. I mean, that's like, <laughs> whatever, you know. Poppy, mm-hmm. tell us about you. Okay, so I think I wrote to you, Deborah, on the 1st of Feb. And I think the reason why I wrote to you was I was l- the week leading up to that email I sent to you, which was around how do I bring, I really, I was feeling really angry and I wanted to bring attention to the British, South Asian, professional women's voice. And the reason why was I'd had several conversation with other female, other women, um, Bangladeshi, Indian women who were working in senior jobs in the city, but who all had this sort of, well, not even the duality, just this very complex context and I just wanted to bring attention to that so I'll give you some examples so I had as a Asian woman CEO I've turned up at meetings or sort of events where I, you know there was one time I was taking my coat off in the cloakroom and somebody came over a white man and handed me their coat because they thought I was staff yeah, really interesting. And um, at the end of last year, I went to an event where I was keynote speaker at a law firm in the city. And um, as I was signing in to register, the reception staff went, you know, so are you catering? <laughs> Which, do you know what? I have got, you know, my family are from the restaurant industry. It's not about the role. And I really want to make that clear because I have, you know, I'm a working class background I have complete respect for whatever job you're doing, just have work ethics, because that's what my family taught me. But I think it's the fact that as an Asian woman, I clearly could not have been the keynote or the CEO. It was catering or, you know, hospitality staff. So I think there's that. And I think then what I was getting caught up in was I've spent 20 years of my career playing a game to have a place at the table and actually not necessarily rock the boat. And it just struck me that maybe now, for the next phase of my career, I probably, I want to rock the boat. Because actually, where do our daughters and the younger generation look to role models? Because when I was young, there was no sari wearing professional in the Bank of England doing a presentation. Do you know what I mean? So women like me didn't exist on platforms. So in a weird kind of way, that was quite cool because it drove me to be consistently the first in that space because I really wanted, I've got daughters to be able to pave that way. And also from my friends, you know, my white friends, kids to also see professional power associated with little Asian woman in saris. Do you know what I mean? So I think there's that. I think there's also, you know, that constant thing about being on panels. I've led on national campaigns around mental health, primarily because that's my career. And when it's come to the day of the event, the panel was all men and I had to kick up a storm around the fact that I, and actually mainly women, had created campaigns and yet the panel was made up of men and white men. And that was politically the right thing to do because of position in yada, yada, yada. And I just think, when is all of that going to change in my professional career? And then I come back to the stories that really hit me when I emailed you was I'd spoken to three women in a week and one was running her own business, one was a lawyer in a big bank. And when I ask them about their family situations or their marriage, for example, their voices dropped, their eyes looked down when they talked about the fact that they were divorced. And I'm on my third marriage, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's a big deal in my family. You know, like, we don't talk about that. That is just uh, like can't talk about the hair can you imagine like you're not you're certainly not talking about Poppy's marriage your mom's like it's the hairstyle that's yeah. what's got us <laughs> that's what it's done. if you hadn't cut your hair we wouldn't be here yeah, yeah exactly um, and I for years also just didn't draw attention to my marriages and 
in my family context, but in the last sort of couple of years, I've become much more vocal about going, oh, you know, I'm on my third marriage. And the reason why I do that is I see women of my generation in their 40s, particularly, who have come from that place of total shame in your community, even though you're earning, you don't owe anybody anything, but your identity is completely caught up with being in a marriage and in a relationship, even though you're single parenting, raising your children, you know. And I just thought, wow, isn't it incredible? I'm, I'm surrounded by these amazing, powerful women who are like <laughs> doing some big business in the city. And yet, when they're talking about their personal identity, they can't even look me in the eye. Let, do you know what I mean? They can't make eye contact because of the shame that's attached with that. And actually, we need to get rid of that shit. And actually, people like me probably need to rock the boat. And I guess that's partly why, why I'm here. And then one more last point, going back to your bit around Amrit, you know, being in, 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 in Delhi. And I, when I go to Bangladesh, you know, people go to me, oh, you, you cook and you eat with your fingers? Like, wow, like that's a revelation because I'm British. So where do women like me fit? apart from when we're hanging out with our mates. And I think that is a challenge for our identity, and I think that needs to change. Mm. So you're both in that space between British culture and South Asian culture and finding your own voice and speaking on behalf of women who might not fit, and it may not be because they have two cultures, it may be they don't fit within their own culture, and they are seeing in you somebody who will step forward and be yourself, and part of yourself is that you wear a sari, and part of yourself is that you have short hair, and part of yourself Mm. is that you didn't stay in an unhappy marriage, that Mm. you pushed forward. Part of yourself is your experience at SOAS with your education, wanting to draw on all sorts of cultural inspirations for your music and not just say, oh, well, it's now I better play guitar and dress the way that pop stars dress now. What would you like young women who are coming up to do, Amrit, because you're there? How would you like to change things? I think it's changing a lot already, and I think social media has been a huge part of that. Um, There are so many of my peers who are musicians, are artists, are social media influencers. They're aesthetically very proud of where they come from and they're incorporating a lot of South Asian or um, wherever they come from aesthetic. But I think there's a long way to go still in terms of accepting what we are within ourselves as well because sometimes it can become too much of an external thing and we're not thinking about, hang on, what does it mean? And is the question, do I have to fit in? And if I do fit in, like, why am I trying to fit in? Why is the energy being directed to trying to fit in somewhere when you could just be blissfully enjoying what you are? And I think from my personal perspective, like, I play the serengi, which is an Indian classical instrument, but also played in Punjabi folk music. And it's traditionally played by men. And it is a very male-dominated world when you look at Indian classical. Um, There are many amazing female vocalists and sitarists as well but it's still very much male-dominated. And my experience learning through that was that I'm going to have to figure this out on my own because I'm not going to get the kind of learning that I want from being in a male-dominated environment. So then I looked to Aretha Franklin and Etta James and their voices and learned as much as I could from hearing them. And then I found Abid Parveen and, and Noor Jahan from what is now Pakistan and... You didn't just, just say Avril Lavigne there, did you? No, Abida Bovine. <laughs> just checking, just checking. But I that's thought that's good, what that's you said. That's a good said. rhyme I can use in a song, though. I'll keep that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's what you said, but I thought, I'll just check. <laughs> Avril Lavigne from Pakistan. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, um, I think, yeah, there's still a long way to go, and I think we're all in our, once we address our personal journeys, that turns into a community on its own. I mean, my question for you is, why have you got to make everything so complicated? I know. <laughs> Sorry, that is a Lavra Levine lyric. I, this is a joke. Sorry. I, I really... That's why I'm not a comedian. That's, is that, am I saying the lyric right? Yeah. Why you got to make everything so complicated? <laughs> First. <Okay>. Frustrated. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's... Just one Avril Lavigne fan making the rock hands and singing every <laughs> lyric in the front row. You should totally do a guilty feminist karaoke. 
I know, we <laughs> wanted to do Masayoki. We will. We've talked to the people who do Masayoki, which is... Uh, I has anyone been to Masayoki? Well, the, sc- the lyrics come up on the screen, so everyone sings, but they also have comedians and people up the front singing and leading it, so it's like a cross between karaoke and... The lyrics are for us all. Uh, and we wanted to do like feminist classics. So nice. if we did that, would you come along, Amrit? And of course. Lead? I've never been, I've never done karaoke. <laughs> There's a first time and a last time for everything. And yeah. sometimes it's the same time. Yeah. And <laughs> hey, uh, Poppy, what is it that you want our audience to take away from you being here tonight and our global listeners? What would you like us to do differently, see differently? Is there anything we can do, act upon, engage with? Yeah, it's the same agenda, isn't it? So race battles cannot be won by just brown and black people. You know, Asian women issues cannot be addressed without having allies. And I think, for me, what is it that everybody can do? There's two or three things. So, first of all, you know, when you... Sometimes it's really annoying when you hear people like me being really frustrated and actually ranting at whatever it is, whether it's a dinner party or whether it's... And actually recognise that there's a whole back load of baggage that's come with actually fighting to be at the table and maybe that day we're just having a really shit time so actually at that point reaching out and listening with your heart because that's probably all that's needed because I'm probably questioning why the hell I'm here on that day I think another thing that we can do most of us have workplaces we are at work when recruitment practices promotion practices projects are being dished out really have a think about who's been included and who's been excluded and you don't have to if you're not in a power position of influence and power but just ask the question you know shouldn't we be looking in the places that we don't normally look to bring in the voices that aren't normally there and that will automatically create depth and breadth to your project your workplace whatever and I think the other thing is lone voices you know when you've got someone who is you know the exotic Asian woman in the corner (laughs) which I get you know again another thing that gets churned our way you know it's There's a lone voice there, and I think really be the ally at that board meeting, at that team meeting of the person that isn't being heard and make sure that they are being heard and actually their idea isn't then passed off as somebody else's idea. Can I jump in here? We'd love it. I was just interested in... You were talking about the Asian women you'd spoken to who are ashamed about their marriages not working. This is a very Asian thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I guess my, I'd, I'd be very interested. Are there organizations, et cetera, that we can know about to raise awareness within our communities so that women who get a divorce in our communities, I mean, it's horrible for them. Mm. So where can we look to that there are places that can raise awareness within our communities so that these women don't feel like that? And it's a very tricky one because it's a generational issue. You see what I mean? Mm. I mean, women in my generation can get divorced and live it through, but their parents will never live it mm. through. Are there organizations like that? Do you know what's in the... I don't know, because this, like I said, I wrote to Deborah on the 1st of Feb, so I'm really on a bit of a mission on this agenda. Mental health has been my thing, and gender and race is sort of fastly becoming my thing for the next bit. So I'm not sure which organizations we should go to, but for me, this is about taking it out of those organizations and putting it in our homes. Do you know what I mean? So actually, how is it that you and I and Deborah and I'm, you know, how are we talking about relationships and our identities tied up with those relationships? And are we women and professionals and mothers and, you know, are all of those identities coming before the fact that we're married, girlfriend, but you know, whatever. It's before we're associated to a relationship. And I think it's that. So I don't want to, for me, when you talk about sort of the divorce breakdown, we always are looking at what we are not and actually how do we turn it on its head and look at what we are. And therefore, how can me and my colleagues and my peers go, you know, I'm Poppy, I'm a professional, I'm a CEO, I've done X, Y, and Z, I'm a mother. And actually, my partnership, my relationship, marriage isn't an issue. And when I am talking about it, yeah, I've had three, three, I'm on my third relationship, brilliant. And what? So I think it's about how do we talk about it within our families? So how do I educate my mom and my aunties to not 
roll their eyes or whisper and make someone feel like shit mm. because they've got a divorce or had a divorce or whatever. It's how do we as women of different generations be allies to women in our communities? It's that. So I think for me, it's taking it out of services and we don't need to be educated about how we make people feel ashamed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> No, I mean, I guess I meant more because obviously as Asians we have that because we have our families, mm. you know, but for people who are not in Asian families, mm. if they wanted to just understand even what it was. But no, absolutely. And I mean, I think this speaks to everything that goes on at Guilty Feminist, yeah. which is how are we raising our daughters, but also yeah. our sons. Mm. You know? And how can we ally for each other? How can we be compassionate, be understanding, allow people to live their full sense of self-expression, allow people to be who they are, love who they love, live how they live, and really, ultimately, every day we're making that a little bit easier for somebody else, that's feminism. Yeah. 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 Welcome to the stage, the incredible Amrit Kaula here. So joining me on stage, we have my younger brother, Pradab Singh. Oh. Um, he'll be playing the doubler. And on guitar, we've got Nick Grimes, the incredible. <laughs> so the instrument I'm playing is called the sarangi. And it's one of the instruments in the world that is known to be the closest instrument to a, a human voice. And sometimes when you hear it played, um, people mistake it for a woman singing. So um, it has 40 strings on it and it's probably one of the most versatile instruments and one of the most sampled as well. Um, the song I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play a combination of three. So the first song I'm starting off with is the end of a Punjabi song that I sing. It was originally a poem written by Amrita Pritham. Now Amrita Pritham was a feminist. She was a progressive writer in the 1950s in India. And she was one of the first people that spoke out against the women that were silenced during the partition of India. So for those who aren't familiar with Indian history and the partition of India in 1947, a border was drawn across the Punjab, but also across West India as well. And that's how Bangladesh was created. But that's also how Pakistan was created. So Pakistan all used to be Punjab. And um, during this uh, border that was drawn by the British, um, we saw the largest forced migration in the history of the world. And my grandparents were a part of that. But amongst that history, we were very, very familiar with key figures like Gandhi and Mountbatten and Nehru and all of these major political figures that we forget about the history of the people and the masses. And a major part of that history was how women were treated during the partition. So in this frenzy, this chaos, women had become territory and they were raped, mutilated, abducted. Um, and women took extreme measures to try and protect themselves. There were stories of women wearing poison around their neck to be able to commit suicide before their honor was taken. And this history was silenced as soon as partition had happened. So each nation, Pakistan and India, were trying to recreate their nations that these histories were written out. And Amrita Pritham wrote this poem and she speaks directly to Vardish Shah, who was kind of the equivalent of Shakespeare. Like he wrote um, the equivalent of Romeo and Juliet, but he wrote it like years before. Um, and she says to him, Vardish Shah, speak from your grave. Look at your Punjab now. You wrote an epic for one woman. You must speak from your grave and write more. And that's how the poem begins. And I can't justify a translation, but the way that I needed to express it was to write it to music. And that's what I did for a play we directed at Saras. And um, she goes on to describe the state of Punjab and what Punjab looked like. Punjab is called Punjab because Banj means five and Ab means river. This is the land of five rivers that was divided. And she's the first person who wrote it and I, I just want to pay tribute to that and I hope, because I'm singing it in Punjabi, that it 
I do justice to it. Um, you'll hear the word ball a lot, and ball literally means speak in many South Asian languages. So that's the first little section I'm singing. Then I go into a song called Blind, which I wrote, and it's kind of like the biggest I'm a feminist but song. Um, and then I end with a Sufi traditional poem. And the most amazing thing about Punjabi folk and Sufi is that they're traditional, but the messaging is so non-conformist. And it's against, you know, just any kind of boundary and it's all for fluidity and it's just joyous in so many ways. So here goes. That's my long introduction, but I hope it pays off because I'm singing in different languages. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for listening. Everything that you think is right 
see there's always been fire in this world I might have shown you if I could There was always water in my earth I let myself forget my worth So take me someplace everybody's blind I wanna go somewhere they won't mind me Where they won't know who I am So tell them not to try and find me Cause even I don't know where I am Cause even I don't know who I am Cause even I don't know Anywhere Anywhere, anywhere but here Anywhere, anywhere but here Anywhere, anywhere but here So take me someplace everybody's blind I wanna go somewhere they won't mind me Where they won't know who I am so You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White. Yes, co-host Sindhu V and our very special guest, Poppy Jarman and Amrit Kaula here. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Salinsky for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Jacob, Sally and everyone at King's Place. As well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. This is The Guilty Feminist and the podcast in which... Oh, bugger. Last time in so long, and I've fucked it. <laughs> a huge thank you to our amazing patrons who have supported this podcast at the Smash the Patriarchy level or above Sarah Belcher, Valerie Marr, John Quakoy, Sarah Brown, Sarah Boom, and Ruby Rose Thompson. <laughs>